All right, good to be here this morning. Amen. And as Zephan said, what a beautiful day. Amen. And yesterday was a beautiful day, a little windy, but beautiful day. Amen. Another day here, and we're thankful for that. Uh, I might just remind you that uh, Brother Steve Montgomery is going to have at least what he said was a battery replaced in a in a pacemaker. Now whether they're going to replace the battery or the whole thing, I don't know. But uh, Brother Steve Montgomery's up in his nineties. He lives in Louisiana. He's been a missionary and a faithful servant of the Lord for many, many years. And let's just be sure and remember him in our prayers. I visited with him a few days ago and had a nice visit. He really doesn't ask for anything, but uh, simply that we remember him in prayer. And so I would ask you to do that. And uh, as was said, we want to be sure and remember Daisy in our prayers. I think that baby was due two months ago, <laughs> but I know I know it's getting time, and uh, so let's let's remember that family in our prayers. And I'm gonna ask Brother Zephon if he will pass out, and I got my wife to type this. Just want to give you a copy of it. I'm not going to really refer to this today. But, but this is a chronology of the crucifixion, and you might bring it with you uh, next week and following, and we'll refer to some of the things on this. Uh, I might just say to those that are online, we had some technical difficulties in getting these out to you guys. So we, oh, you think we did? Yeah. All right, good. Glad to hear that. So I'll, I will, Lord willing, uh, next week and a week or two thereafter be referring to some of the things on that, but it's it's simply a type list of the crucifixion, the chronology of the crucifixion. And uh, and I'll, I'll wait just a, another minute or two till those are passed out and and, uh, and Jeff on what we might do is we might just put those up here or somewhere and I know there'd be some people that come maybe next week yeah uh like Kenneth and Judy or whoever and uh and we'll be sure that they that they get a copy of that and uh but you remember last week we concluded our lesson with the fact that they led Jesus away to be crucified. And this chronology begins with the place that they came to and then the series of events that followed that. All right. Now, this is an important word. And I want you to pay attention. Through much scientific investigation, it has been determined that people learn more when they are awake <laughs> are all of you awake okay so much for the humor. <laughs> I'll give you just a brief review. Our lesson today is a continuation of the general heading of Christology. This is sermon number 22, dealing again with the crucifixion. And in our last sermon, we left off with Jesus being led away to be crucified. In Luke 23, verse 26, led away because the scripture must be fulfilled. He was first led away, not dragged, as though resisting, because Isaiah was quoted as having said, 
he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. Acts 8, verse 32. We also learn that he was led away because according to the law, capital punishment had to be executed outside the city, as in 1 Kings 21, verse 13. Thus, in fulfillment, he was led away and said to have been crucified nigh to the city. John 19, verse 20. Now Mark wrote that with him they crucified two thieves. Mark 15, 27. Again, nothing happened by chance. Humanly speaking, I might say the purpose of his being crucified with two thieves was to show the unfathomable depths of shame into which he was subjected. But scripturally speaking, it was foretold some 700 years before that he would be numbered with the transgressors. Isaiah 53 verse 12. Thus in being crucified with two thieves, the scripture was fulfilled. Mark 15 verse 27 and 28. Now, that's a little bit of review where we left off last week. On the cross, we are going to find that Jesus would utter seven sayings. And in the chronology of the crucifixion, which was just passed out to you, you have referenced those seven sayings. I'm not going to deal with them this morning. But hopefully you will take a look at that list. What I would like to do this morning is call attention to some particular features of the death of the Lord Jesus. His death is a subject of never failing interest all who study prayerfully the scripture of truth. This is not only because the believers all, both for time and eternity, depends on it, but also because of its transcendent uniqueness. Let me tell you this. There never has been a death like that of the Lord Jesus. When I speak of its transcendent uniqueness, I would like to present this morning four words that sum up the death of the Lord Jesus and show its transcendent uniqueness. Number one, natural. His death was natural. Now I'll explain these words. Number two, his death was unnatural. Now you say, wait a minute. That's just double talk. No, it really isn't. His death was natural. His death was unnatural. And his death was preternatural. P-R-E-T-E-R, -E -E preternatural. And his death was supernatural. Now, these four words give us a sum of the transcendent uniqueness of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to give you a test on these words natural, unnatural, preternatural and supernatural. How many of you have ever thought of his death as related to these four words? Maybe, maybe not. But I've selected them, like I say, because there never has been a death like that of the Lord Jesus. Now, when I say his death was natural, what do I mean by that? I simply mean 
It was a real death. This, this statement seems commonplace, but it is truly an element of wonderment, especially when one remembers that the very one who died was Emmanuel, or God with us. If his death was real, then how was it possible for God to die? The incarnation made it possible. That is when the word was made flesh, John 1 verse 14, the very Lord of glory could and did die. He was put to death in the flesh. 1 Peter 3 verse 18. That is being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross, Philippians 2, verse 8. His humanity made it possible to die. And the reality that his death was real was made more apparent when his body was taken down from the cross, prepared for burial, laid in a tomb, and remained there for three days and three nights. I say again, his death was natural. It was a real death. Now, he did not just swoon and then revive, as some say, but a real death occurred. And that body, as I said, was taken down from the cross, prepared for burial, put in a tomb, and there it remained three days and three nights. So the death of Jesus Christ was natural. Everybody with me on that? All right. Nothing new there. However, the death of Jesus Christ was unnatural. <laughs> and if it was natural, meaning simply that it was real. When I say it was unnatural, what do I mean by that? By unnatural, I simply mean it was abnormal. It was abnormal. It was an exception to the rule. It was abnormal. We just stated that Jesus Christ became capable of suffering to death by reason of the incarnation. Yet it must not be inferred from this that death had a claim on him. Far from this being the case, the very reverse was true. Death is the wage of sin. Romans 6.23 Did he have any? No. Death was the wages of sin, and he had none. Not only did the Lord Jesus Christ enter this world without contracting the defilement resulting from a fallen sin nature inherited from Adam, but while in this world he was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. Hebrews 7, verse 26. He knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, and did no sin, 1 Peter 2, verse 22. Therefore, the death of the Holy One was unnatural. Everyone else who died, died as a result of sin, with one exception, Jesus Christ. Therefore, his death was not only natural in that it was real, but it was unnatural in that it did not result from a sin nature. I know you remember that great verse out of John chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No man cometh unto the Father but by me. When Jesus Christ said, I am the life, what do you think he meant by that? I am the life. <clears throat> Three things come to mind. Number one, he's the source of all life. Because all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Number two, he was the life in that he was the emancipator from death. He said, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. But let me tell you the very real sense. He could and did say, I am the life for one important reason. Because there was no cause of death in him. Without sin, and yet he died. So his death was not as a result of his own sin, as in the case of humanity. But his death was for our sin. All right. Now, his death was what? Natural. You can see that. His death was unnatural. And you can see that. But I gave you two more words. The third word being predator. Natural. And by the way, you can look that word up in the dictionary. Predator, natural. By this, I simply mean that it was marked out and determined for him in eternity past. Before Adam was created, the fall of man was foreseen. Before sin entered into the world, salvation from it had been planned by God. In the eternal counsels of deity, Jesus Christ stood as the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, verse 8. In time, he was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Acts 2, verse 23. And the things that happened to him, the arrest, the trials, his subsequent death, were all things determined before to be done. Acts 4, verse 27 and 28. Thus his death was preternatural, marked out, and determined for him in eternity past. Now, interesting, isn't it? So, natural, unnatural, preternatural, also supernatural. Supernatural. By this, I simply mean that the death of the Lord Jesus Christ was different from all other deaths. You know what scripture comes to mind, Sister Darlene? In all things, he might have the preeminence. Colossians 1, verse 18. His birth was different. In all things, he might have the preeminence. His birth was different. His life was different. His words were different. His works were different. So was his death. It was supernatural. Jesus said, I lay down my life. I lay it down. That I might take it again. No man taketh it from me. But I lay it down to myself. 
I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. John 10, verse 17 and 18. Now, I want to show you how unique this death was. How supernatural it really was. And we're going to read a few scriptures. Turn to Acts chapter 3. <clears throat> Acts chapter 3. Here we read verse 18, written by Luke, spoken by Peter, after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Acts 3, verse 18, you read this. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should what? Huh? that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Now let me remind you of what that verse says. There were many things prophesied in the Old Testament which have not been fulfilled. But those things which God before showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer he had so fulfilled. Now, turn, if you will, to John chapter 19. Now, we want to look quickly at the things which Christ had suffered. Now, how many of you know that a Roman soldier pierced the side of Jesus with a sword? But how many of you are aware of the fact that he didn't suffer in that? You know why? He was already dead. He was already dead. Yeah. Already dead. Now Jesus is on the cross. And a series of things took place. And I've given you a brief of the chronology of the crucifixion. One of the last things that took place, we're going to read about in John 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, and I want you to underscore the words, knowing that all things were now accomplished. Now this one had been on that cross for six hours. He was brutalized before he got put on that cross. And yet near the very end, it says, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saying, what? I thirst. Now what did we just read? In the book of Acts, those things which God before showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. So here near the end of his time on the cross, realizing the end had come, he said, I thirst. Now why do you think he said, I thirst? I think the thirst was real. No doubt about that. Because that Messianic Psalm, in Psalm 22, verse 15, has him saying, My strength is dried up. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. I believe the thirst was real. But here in John's account, <laughs> knowing that all things were now accomplished, he would say, I thirst. Why? Was he interested in quenching his own thirst? No. He said, I thirst that the scripture 
might be fulfilled. Now he knew that all things were now accomplished. And said, I thirst that the last thing regarding his suffering might be fulfilled. Kind of interesting. Now when he said that, I thirst. And they gave him a set of their so to speak. You know what he did? He bowed his head. He bowed his head. Now you mean this one that had been on that cross for six hours, had his head erect? He was full of aware of where he was in point of time. And he would say one last thing, I thirst, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And when he said that, you know what words went with it? It is finished. It's finished. It's finished. And Matthew records that with a loud voice, now this one had been on that cross for six hours, been mutilated before he got there. Think about his awareness of the scripture. Think about his head erect, he bowed his head. And not with a weak, sickly voice, but with a loud voice. Out his head and dismissed his own spirit. And I say to you, the death of Jesus Christ was supernatural. Now, if you think it wasn't, you just bow your head and dismiss your spirit. Why don't you try that? Just bow your head and dismiss your spirit. But see, there's something else about this. When Jesus was on that cross, John chapter 19 says, verse 31, the Jews therefore, because it was the preparation, and you read about this in verse 14, the preparation of the Passover, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. Well, that Sabbath day was a high day. But... And so what did they do? They besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. In other words, the Jews didn't want Jesus on the cross. Because it was a high day. Now, according to the law, the Jews didn't crucify But one who had been executed could be hanged on a tree. But the body could not stay on the tree overnight. It had to be taken down according to the law. So what the Jews said is we need to expedite death because night is coming. It's a holy occasion. So what do they want done? They want to break the legs of Jesus and the two executed with him. Well, what did breaking the legs have to do with anything? Well, when one hung on that cross by his hands and feet, there was tremendous stress on the arms and the chest. And often one condemned to death would try to raise the weight up with his feet to ease the pain of suffering. But when the legs were broken, they couldn't do that. And so death was expedited. So 
So when they came to Jesus with this proposition, when they came to Pilate with this proposition, okay, I'll, I'll honor your request, get him down off the cross from the dark, so to speak. We'll break the legs. But you know what they found? Jesus was already dead. Now, death by crucifixion was a slow process. In some cases, it lasted for days. But he was dead already. And when Pilate heard that in the 15th chapter of Mark, he marveled that he was dead so soon. And so he consults with a centurion who witnessed the fact, and he wanted to know if Jesus was really dead. When he heard the report of the centurion that he was, then Jesus took him down, or then Pilate took him down from the cross and gave his body to be buried. Now, I want you to just think about this for a minute. He knew that all things were now accomplished. He would say, I thirst. Not to quench his own thirst, but that the scripture might be fulfilled. When it was, he said, it's finished. He cried out with a loud voice. He dismissed his own spirit. Where they wanted to hasten his death, they found he was already gone. I'll say again, his death in every respect was supernatural. It was supernatural. <laughs> he truly did lay down his life. No man took it from him. Four words, all put together, give us the sum of the uniqueness of the death of Jesus Christ. Brother Zephyr, it was natural. It was unnatural. It was preternatural. It was supernatural. There never has been and never will be another death like that. Yeah. It was truly unique. Yeah. And where death, as we've said, is a common lot of man, it is a result of sin. But Jesus Christ did not die because he was a sinner. He died for our sins in payment thereof, that we might go out free. Yeah. They were saying. Man, I know that part. Let me just make this point. How many of you believe when you become a Christian, you're not going to have any hard times? When one of those two thieves became a Christian on that cross, his legs were still broken, and he was put to death. It wasn't exempted from it. But I know they were shocked when it came to Jesus and he was dead already. Then that Roman soldier takes him and pierces his side with a sword. That, that wasn't any suffering for him. He'd already gone. But everything that he would suffer, as foretold in the scripture, would be fulfilled before he would come down from that cross. Right to the last letter, and then he said, it's finished. Thank God he didn't say it started and you have to finish. He said it's finished. And the literal of that is paid in full. Yeah. Jesus paid it all. All to 
to him I owe. Sin has left the crimson stain. He washed it by his snow. Amen. Brother Buddy, what's our song? Page 212, nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. The innocent blood. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Let's sing, Brother Buddy. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me I trust that I've been able to paint a visual picture of the uniqueness of the death of Jesus Christ and how that, that death was marked out in eternity past for sinners like you and for me. And in time, Jesus Christ came and fulfilled what had been predetermined. And I've been asked sometimes, you know, what's the difference between what God the Father does and God the Son does and God the Holy Spirit does? And I like to kind of say it this way. God the Father is an architect. God the Son came to execute the plan. And the Spirit of God made it known. Made it known. But in eternity past, God's thought was on you and on me. Amen. Thank God for his great love toward us. Let's sing one more verse, brother buddy. For my heart and this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as stone. No other sounds I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. And just remember that in all things, he might have the preeminence. My Father, again, we're thankful for this Lord's Day, for your many blessings. We're thankful for those that are present. We pray that we've given a clear understanding and summation of what it meant for our Lord and Savior to die on the cross. We're thankful for your great love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Help us to live a life that honors him. Help us to be thankful and to express our gratitude. Amen. Again, we pray your blessings on those that are present. Be with those that have special need. We pray that your will be done. Forgive us again of our sins, for it's in Christ's name and for his safety we ask it. Amen. Amen. Amen.